Friends, 100 years ago, on the 19th of September, Swami Vivekananda made his presentation of the paper on Hinduism. It was a speech which would reverberate around the world and numerous commentaries have been made on the few words then uttered. And yet, as this centenary celebration draws towards its conclusion, we may question ourselves whether we have fully realized the significance of that moment, that effort to reconstruct Hinduism. I believe we have to go beyond mere emotional fuzziness to ask and to answer that question. From the long view of history, that day and hour holds an import that may not be clear from the text of the proceedings at Chicago. The import becomes clear only when you consider the context, the historical conjuncture, and ask why did Vivekananda's speech create such an impact? The answer is not easy to find. After all, Vivekananda's was not the first exposition of its kind in the Western world. One can recall, for instance, Raja Ram Mohan Roy or Keshav Chandra Sen or at Chicago itself, Reverend Dharampal or P.C. Mazumdar and others. Does Vivekananda's celebrated success was not due to the chronological accident of being the first on the scene. Second, the message of classical Hindu texts was no longer new in the West when he went to Chicago. For about a century preceding, the Orientalist scholars had translated many Sanskrit texts so as to allow Western people access to those texts. He might have construed those texts in his own fashion, but they had been construed before. Thus, novelty was not the reason why his speech produced such an impact. A third possible explanation, leaving aside the charismatic personality of Vivekananda, which is beyond question, may be that his Chicago speech marked the beginning of an initiative that fructified into a missionary and ideological movement of vast proportions. It is perfectly true that the speech did mark such a beginning, but then that is known to us only by virtue of our historical hindsight. It could not have been self-evident to Vivekananda's contemporaries. Therefore, we see that these explanations are inadequate. They cannot fully explain the impact of that speech on the contemporary mind. Perhaps, <clears throat> perhaps we have to seek an explanation in the historical conjuncture when the speech was delivered. Consider the years preceding 1893 and see how Western dominance of the world became visible in a series of events. In Indochina, Cambodia, Ethiopia, Rhodesia, South Africa, Uganda, Nigeria, Egypt, and many parts of <coughs> other parts of Africa, Western domination was firmly established in the five years preceding 1893. In fact, the conference itself was a part of the Colombian Exposition of 1893 in the year following the 400th anniversary of Christopher Columbus's discovery of America, bringing about Europe's penetration and domination in the American continent. It is interesting to note that Vivekananda said on the 19th of September, I quote, we who have come from the East have sat here day after day and have been told in a patronizing way that we ought to accept Christianity because Christian nations are most prosperous. We look about us and we see England, the most prosperous nation in the world, with her foot on the neck of 250 million Asiatics. We look back into history and see that the prosperity of Christian Europe began with Spain. Spain's prosperity began with the invasion of Mexico. In these and other words, we see the historical perspective of Vivekananda. And they contain a clue to his impact on his generation.
he personified independent critical thinking in defiance of Western dominance. And this is equally clear from the numerous felicitation messages which he received after his Chicago performance. In his own speeches, Vivekananda emphasized the intrinsic merit of the Vedantic outlook. But to the common citizen in this country, the confrontation with the West had a significance other than that of spiritual discourse. In this context, one must also remember two other historical facts. One, racism which Vivekananda personally experienced and of which we have other records in his biography. And second, the concerted Christian effort to assert Christian superiority in the Chicago conference. I shall not elaborate on the first point, but on the second, it is worthwhile remembering how on September 19th itself, the day Vivekananda spoke on Hinduism, the air was thick with invectives speeches on the superiority of the Christian faith. By way of a reply to the Christian missionary effort to belittle other religions, Vivekananda spoke on the 10th day of the Chicago conference. I just quote one or two sentences. You Christians who are so fond of sending out missionaries to save the soul of the heathen, why do you not try to save their bodies from starvation? They ask for bread, we give them stone. It is an insult for a starving people to offer them religion. It is an insult to a starving man to teach him metaphysics. Vivekananda rarely took such a contestatory position, but the historical conjuncture, the resentment of the oppressed peoples in two continents under Western dominance, the emotional reaction to Western racism, the resistance of old civilizations of the East to aggressive Christian missionary zeal, the entire historical conjuncture assigned to Vivekananda a contestatory position. It was his ability to hold his own in this position which accounts for his celebrated success at the Chicago Parliament. The greatness of Vivekananda was his ability to rise above the contest between religious faiths. In his major speech on Hinduism, he focuses on universalities to rise above particulars. I conclude with a quote which repeats the message his speech began with. He said, in conclusion, if there is ever to be a universal religion, it must be one which will have no location in place or time, which will not be Brahmanic, or Buddhistic, Christian, or Mohammedan, but the sum total of all these and still have infinite space for development. It will be a religion which will have no place for persecution or intolerance in its polity, which will recognize divinity in every man and woman. This humanist universalism accounts for Vivekananda's enduring influence. The historical context I have tried to analyze explains in part his success in his mission in September 1893. But his real success lay in his ability to rise above the historical constraints of the times. It is given to few to overcome history and he was one of them. Thank you.